trickle in here as, as uh, the, the um, networking period comes to a close. But I am Brian Wassum. If you weren't here in the previous session that I was also moderating, I am a partner at the law firm of Honigman, Miller, Schwartz, and Cohn in Detroit, Michigan. I'm also the chair of that firm's social, mobile, and emerging media practice group, um, which I've worked studiously on being able to say five times fast. Um, that, that is a, the group that actually I pulled together for a specific reason and called it emerging media, I included that in the title, for the specific purpose of including AR because it's a focus area of mine. I represent some of the companies here at the conference. I also am the, an officer and the legal counsel to augmentedreality.org, the organization that puts on this conference. And I also blog, where I've blogged for the last uh, few years, at Augmented Legality. Dot com, where we discuss a lot of the issues that uh, we'll be uh, talking about in, in some detail here today. Our focus of this panel is um, the, the near term, and that is specifically what are the legal and ethical concerns that we will encounter in the augmented space right now, what are we dealing with right now, and what we'll be dealing with in the very near term. Uh, IP or intellectual property is, is a very big focus of that, and that will be the primary focus of, of both of our legal presenters here on the panel. But, you know, it's not the only area of law by, by a long shot that AR implicates. For example, in this past year, we saw the first example of people getting arrested for using augmented reality. Players of the Ingress multi, uh, must massively multiplayer um, augmented reality game uh, have been picked up by police or detained for, for doing things that appear odd to people who aren't work, working with digital content. So this is actually a subject you can uh, delve into in more detail on my blog, but uh, where, we, where I've interviewed some people playing these types of games. And for example, one uh, Reddit user uh, gained notoriety for being picked up by the police after standing there in front of the police station pointing his phone at it and getting, and getting some odd looks. So you, you, you think you'd think of that, but you know these, these uh, digital objects are where they are, right? That's what makes augmented reality augmented is that it has a tie to the physical world. And so when these are, the digital objects find themselves in uh, interesting places in the physical world or, or odd or hard to access or sensitive areas in the physical world, you get misunderstandings. And we're starting to see that uh, manifest itself in the real world. And apparently that's been happening all over the world. There's an issue in, in, in um, Europe as well from a similar uh, user of a similar game. But what is, I think, the most keenly important for all of you, and what we all, all believe is uh, the most keenly important uh, legal issue for you to understand, and we've, we've heard this from other speakers yesterday and today, is intellectual property, and specifically out of intellectual property, uh, which includes obviously copyrights, trademarks, and a variety of, of types of protection, and that's the world of patents. We, and the reason that this has become, again, such an, a near-term issue for you is in, within the past year, we have seen real patent infringement litigation happen in the augmented space. We'll hear a little bit about that today. There is supposed to be a breakout session later tonight where we might be able to into that topic a little bit more deeply, but we have seen uh, what's called a patent troll or a non-practicing entity that owns patent rights someone else created going out there and suing um, users of augmented technology for, uh, for what they're doing, specifically for the augmented content that, that, that they're using. And they're, you know, these, these guys are, are smart and they're tricky. They, they sue the people, the, the clients who use the technology, the retailers who use the technology instead of the company who created the technology and has a vested interest in, in defending it. So they're out there uh, leeching off the, the potential of the industry, and we'll talk about what we can do about that. But no more from me. I want to introduce the speakers to you. And what we're going to do is, is each speaker is going to take about 15 minutes of our time here to present on their given topic, and then we'll uh, make time for questions at the end. If you have a, 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 a burning question that can't wait, you know, let us know, but, but uh, we'll, we'll save time for that interaction at the end and um, address those questions all at once. So our first speaker is Brett Kruger. Brett is a partner of mine at Honigman Miller. We both work in the same office. He actually began um, his, his uh, introduction to this, this field as an inventor and an entrepreneur, founded two different companies uh, that, that commercialized his own inventions and, and paid for his law school that way to become a patent lawyer. Um, so he's, he's, he's succeeded in doing the types of things that you all are doing right now. Um, he, he worked at Fish and Richardson, a very uh, well-known patent law firm on the East Coast for several years before uh, joining our firm. And, and in 2010, he, he counsels clients ranging from Fortune 100 companies um, all the way down to, to startups, many of uh, the types of companies that are represented here in, in this conference. Uh, he focuses on patents in the mechanical engineering, robotics and autonomous mobile robots, automation, medical devices, and optical devices. 
uh, industries, and he's here to talk to us about the importance of intellectual property law. Brett. Yeah, we could switch to the laptop input for him. Can you guys hear me okay? All right, great. Thank you. So thanks, Brian. You already introduced me. I can skip that slide. <laughs> um, so as a patent attorney, one of the first things I always like to mention and at least bring to the forefront of your minds at your companies is to think about intellectual property and how you can protect it. I always recommend setting up some sort of innovation review program where you can identify, evaluate, procure, and enforce your IP rights. So some of the things that I generally will help companies do is set up that program. They can develop and manage their IP, for, IP portfolio, map their products in f current and future to their portfolio, identify gaps, and then see where they need to move their IP in the future to protect what they're doing. Um, and that's something that you need to do, especially in a new and emerging technology like augmented reality, because if you can get what we call a pioneering patent in a new area, you can block a lot of people, hold a lot of space, and garnish a lot of clout in that marketplace. So there's kind of four basic areas of intellectual property. A lot of you probably know this, but I thought I'd give a quick refresher. You've got patents, trademarks, and copyrights. Now, one of the biggest misconceptions about patents when people apply for them, and I hear this a lot actually with small inventors, is they think that the patent gives them a right to do something. It doesn't give you a right to practice your invention. It gives you a right to exclude others from practicing your invention. So when you apply for a patent, think about what you want to keep others from doing. Trademark is something that is a source identifier, a way for your, cons your customers and, and the public at large to identify what you're providing to them is identified with your company. Copyright is a fixed uh, work of original authorship in a fixed tangible medium and then trade secret is something to just keep confidential. So a lot of you are gonna have software and I used to be a software programmer myself um, for several years. I was a senior software engineer for Netflix actually. And I used to actually design things with GUIs. So one big question, when I get a, and, I, and I do software patents as well, um, one big question I get from inventors is how do I protect not only what I'm showing, the GUI, but also the back end. And I thought today I'd spend a little bit of time about protecting your GUI. And you have a couple options. You got design patents, trade dress, and copyrights. And I'll kind of go over the caveats and the pros and cons of each. Now, the strongest one I think is the design patent for a number of reasons. So a design patent is to protect the ornamental appearance of an article of manufacture. That means that you have to show something that's being, a product that you're selling, a product that's being made, or, or something that's being manufactured. For software, it's generally shown on a device, a computer screen, or in many of the cases here, it would be maybe your digital glass device. Now, in a design patent, what's shown in solid lines is claimed, what's shown in dashed lines is not claimed. And here, the environment, which would be the, the computer device, you can see it more clearly on the right side, is shown in dashed lines. So it's kind of showing the environment of what your software is being displayed on. Now, in the case of digital glass, you would have maybe a, uh, an eyewear shown in dashed lines, and then on the screen of that, the software that you're providing on that. You could also do it on a handheld device. You could have multiple embodiments in your design patent showing both and pursue each of them. Now, one nice thing about a design patent uh, is it has the option for expedited examination for, a sm I call it a relatively small fee of $900 by the patent office, and they'll fast track your design patent application. I've gotten design patents as quickly as four months for clients, so it's a good way to get protection quickly. Not to mention the patent office uh, gives first doc first action allowances on design patents more often than not. A second option is trade dress. Now, trade dress is a form of trademark and for, to get that type of protection, you need to be using your product in commerce. For design patent, you don't have to use it in commerce. You could apply for that and, and never even show, it to, show your product to anybody. But for trade dress, you need to be using your product in the market. You have to have distinctiveness or show secondary meaning. That means basically that someone is identifying your product as a source uh, to your product. So if you, some common examples are 
like on footwear, you see the Nike swoosh, you know it's Nike. Um, your trade dress also has to be non-functional. Now this can be a problem with your GUI because it could be perceived as operational and functional. So getting trade dress protection on your GUI might be difficult at times. Depend upon, it depends upon what you're trying to protect. Um, one strategy, and I kind of put it up there so you can read it and maybe try to remember it, is I generally recommend pursuing a design patent first. One, because you can get quick protection. Um, and there's a, a lot of pros to it and there's a few cons compared to the other options. And then secondly, once you're using your product in commerce for a certain period of time, say five years, that allows you to acquire secondary meaning, you can then pr pursue trade dress. And I've success successfully done this for several clients where we've pursued a design patent first, then used the product in commerce for a number of years, and then got trademark, trade dress protection, which can last indefinitely, as long as you keep using it in commerce. Flash is a copyright. So again, it's, it has to be fixed in some tangible form of expression. Um, and it has to be, you have to be able to separate the design or the, or the copyrightable elements from the functional elements. And due to varying case law, um, the level of protection you can get, you can get in copyright can vary uh, depending upon where you try to sue on it. You can't try to protect individual elements such as icons or arrangements of icons or elements, um, but um, I, I would consider this to probably be the weakest option, but it does have a purpose and, and and there are good times to use it. You have to, the best option is to obviously talk to a patent attorney or intellectual property attorney and discuss what your product is, what your goals are um, business-wise and technology-wise and find out what protection best suits your purpose. I kind of put together a, a, a table here. It might be hard to see, but I just was throwing up a bunch of information here. You can read it as you sit there. But I want to just kind of give some comparisons between the three ways of protecting your design. Um, and some of the quick things I just highlighted in red there for copyright, for criteria for registration, you have to, again, be able to separate the functional aspects from the copyrightable aspects. Trade dress is, again, it has to be non-functional, but the nice thing about a design patent is you can have functional aspects. It just can't be dictated by that utilitary function. So, uh, you know, footwear, footwear. You can, you, I'm just giving that as an example because I see you twitching your foot, sorry. And you can do a design patent on the outsole of that shoe, but also it has functional aspects as well. So the ornamental appearance of that outsole is, is, is protectable, but the functional aspects are still allowed in it because the ornamental appearance may outweigh the functional aspects. I won't get into all the case law about design patents. I could go on for about three hours on them and what would be considered possibly claimable and not claimable if it has various degrees of functionality. And I won't bore you with that because you guys, probably, if we're lucky, there might be maybe one other attorney out there, but probably not. So, um, I'll just give you a quick highlight on the tests of infringement just so you know them. For copyright, the two works have to be substantially similar. For trade dress, there's a, a likelihood of confusion test and there's uh, several factors, I think seven factors, um, and you can look it up. They're pretty well known. I, I won't bore you on that as well because I only have a certain amount of time. And then for design patents, it's the ordinary observer. Uh, if the ordinary observer thinks that two designs are, are substantially similar in light of the prior art, meaning that if there's a lot of prior art out there, there's going to be more deference toward a, a stricter, narrower construction of, w of what is, is uh, claimed um, then you can get a claim of infringement. Now here with augmented reality, it's a new and emerging field. There's not gonna be as much prior art per se out there around there, so you might get broader scope afforded to you in your design. Um, one big thing to mention again is there's no protection against independent creation with a copyright, so if someone else independently creates that same expressive form, you won't be able to stop them. Well, with trade dress and pat design patents, you can. And again, with design patents, um, it's available for useful things, whereas you have to not have any functional aspects to copyright and trade dress. And it protects against independent creation, and you don't have to be selling your product in commerce to get a design patent, where you would have to, um, you can file for you know intent to use before you uh, register your, your, your trade dress, but after a period of time, you have to show use in commerce to get the registration. Now, 
I talked a bunch about the design side. Now, what about what's behind that GUI? Um, I, I know I, I would spend just as much time programming uh, what was happening behind that GUI as I was creating the GUI. Actually, more time what's behind it than what's in, in front of it. Um, and for that, you'd use a utility patent. And you could use a copyright for the code itself. Now, just a quick comparison. Utility patent is for the structure and function. So you're claiming this, the function of your software. Design would be the ornamental appearance. So there's a big difference there. Utility is for 20 years from its earliest filing date, with maintenance fees every four years up to its 12th year. You can file provisional or non-provisional. Provisional, I generally recommend if you're still developing your product and you don't necessarily have it in a full concrete form, and then you have 12 months from that anniversary date to file a non-provisional. The, the, not, the provisional is never examined. It's just a placeholder to hold your idea with the patent office to get that filing date but it's sometimes it's good to uh, use when you're still developing your idea, but you want to get that protection, especially since after March 16th, we are now first to file. There's a bunch of new patent laws that came into effect. I'm sure you, many of you have heard of the American Vents Act that was signed into law last year. And if two people think of the same idea on different days, say someone over here thinks of an idea three months ago and you think of it today, you file a patent on it tomorrow, a patent application, but they thought of it first, you're going to win. There's some caveats on some exceptions, but, um, but before it was first to conceive of the invention, and now you don't have that luxury, so it is first to file. There's a grace period, but um, I don't recommend relying on it much right yet because nobody's tested out the uh, derivation proceedings. I won't go into that either. Maybe Ben will. I don't know. Um, and with software patents, I've only got a few minutes left. I can't help but mention CLS Bank. It is the most recent uh, court case on software patents, and I just want to mention it because uh, many of you have probably heard about it. Whether or not um, uh, the, you know, the, the death of the e-salesman is coming about or not, we don't know. Um, maybe the Supreme Court will, will decide to take up the case. But right now, the Patent Office has issued a memo that they're going to stay the course. They're not going to... Um, change how they are examining software patents. But uh, whoever you decide to use for a patent attorney, make sure they're aware of the caveats of how they're drafting the claims so that they can make sure that they, when your patent eventually issues, because it takes about three to five years to get a software patent issuance, and the case law is going to change a lot between then, that your claims are still good by that point. Um, now, I, I think I have maybe one more minute or not. Um, basically, in that case, um, it was towards, and it's right up Ben's out, actually. He does, uh, he does financial stuff, but, um, uh, but it was towards a, uh, a financial software program, which you guys probably don't really care about because we're all here about AR. But think about if it was AR. What, what, what if it wasn't a, a financial package? What if it was AR? And the big issue here is what is patentable subject matter? Is it an abstract idea? Is your an idea an abstract idea? And are you merely tying it to a computer just to make it seem patentable subject matter? That, that would be the question uh, that, that the court would have to decide on whether your claims are patentable. And you would want to make sure that you're either tying it somehow closely to a, a um, hardware or, or a computer or a specialized computer or, or doing something special on that computer um, to make sure you have allowable and patentable subject matter. Um, and I, I kind of noted that there was, it was split decision and the, the two main uh, the, the, the two opinions of judges that were kind of noted the most was Chief Judge Laurie and Chief Judge Rader. Judge Rader is pro-patents. He's a, he's a great guy. Um, and he's always on the side of, of trying to move intellectual property forward. And I think his, his idea is, is great, and that's that um, you must have some meaningful, meaningful limitation that restricts the claim to a particular application. And with that, he was kind of saying that if you're tying it to a system and you're, it's, it has something meaningful done, um, meaning, um, I don't know if I can give you an example. I'll give you an AR example. So say I've got some digital eyeglass on and I am looking at that thing there. I'm getting some, I'm getting some sort of optical uh, signal coming into that, right? So if you're receiving an optical signal, and you're processing it on device, and then you're meaningful doing, doing something, say I'm, now I'm projecting something. If you tie it to the hardware of projecting or something of some other sort, um, you'd have a better chance of getting that claim allowed. 
And I think I'm about up, so I'm gonna hand it over. I'm not gonna go into too much depth. I'm not sure what Ben's talking about, but he might have more to say, so that's it. All right, awesome, thank you, Brett. We're going to segue now to Matt um, Asimchek and Ben Asplin, and then uh, we'll, who will talk about their firsthand experience taking the types of rights that Brett just explained to you in the abstract and uh, applying them in the specific context of their own um, AR patent, their own AR invention. And then we're, we'll finish with uh, Nicola. Liberati, who will talk to us about now we have these patented devices, we're using them out in society, what are the ethical implications that those raise? Matt Simchek is the uh, president and CEO of Zugara, who, um, which is a, is a company that is on the forefront of visu the visual retail experience and using AR to make that happen. Uh, Zucara recently uh, secured last year a, an actual patent, which puts them already ahead of the curve of a lot of companies in this space because Matt has been thinking ahead to the need that, to get those pioneering patent protections that, that Brett mentioned, to be out on the forefront before the, the space is gobbled up by other patent claimants and went out and staked his own claim and, and actually received that uh, social shopper patent for his... his uh, particular method of doing things, which applies to just briefly, I've, I've, I've cut out and cut and paste here the, the description they use of their patent, but it, it's, a, it's a pretty broad claim. It's, it's any virtual wearable item um, that co covers the sizing and the fit of that virtual item on top of the physical person standing in front of the webcam and seeing the, uh, the item of apparel uh, overlaid on top of them. The social shopping experience, which includes both taking the photos of the virtual wearable item on top of the user and multiple people trying on the same wearable item simultaneously. And also the, the gesture, the motion, and the voice control that one uses to interact with the digital display on the screen. With him is Ben Esplin. He's a, a, a patent lawyer, as, as Brett mentioned, at the Pillsbury Firm and uh, graduated in 2007 from the George Washington University School of Law. He's been a patent law clerk and a patent examiner before that as well. And um, Ben works with Matt and, and uh, specifically on their, um, this particular patent. So. Matt, I'd, I'd like to start off by, by asking you, I, I, I alluded at the outset to uh, this whole um, patent troll situation. I want to get that out, out in the open here and, and, and talk about what that's about. And I understand there are, there, there are ongoing proceedings that some involve you and, and your clients, some of uh, other clients and other, other creators. But um, what happens when a, a company uh, like yours uh, has a patent and then and is, is, is commercializing that patent and finds themselves dealing with uh, a patent troll, somebody who is actually filing litigation uh, against you and your clients for uh, uh, exercising that patent? Uh, well, that's a tough area right now because, um, you know, in the AR industry, a lot of, there are a lot of startups and uh, most of us are in customer acquisition mode. So typically you are, you're required to indemnify a client. So it's kind of a catch 22. You want to go out and sign as many retailers as you, uh, to use your software. But on the other hand, you know that there's a patent troll out there lurking that's going to sue them for, for funds and you're then liable for that. So it's a, it's a dangerous area right now. Mm -hmm. so. Ben, your firm is, uh, is, has worked with, uh, Matt in, in dealing with these areas. And again, I know, understand there's some, there's some sensitivities to specific examples, but, but what sort of, uh, what sort of advice do you, you give to your clients when they find themselves in this situation? Uh, well, we, we actually work, uh, occasionally with clients that are, that have been sued by a patent aggregator, you know, someone who acquires patent rights after, after the company that originated them has sold them off and then looks to monetize those rights through licensing or, or through suits. All of these claims are not created equal, um, just as all, all of anything isn't created equal. And, and we were, we're, we're painting with kind of a, a broad brush here. Um, but a lot of times, or sometimes, what we find is these claims are borderline spurious, right? They're, they're almost extortive in that the, the uh, plaintiff knows that it's going to cost the defendant uh, a substantial sum of money just to respond to the claim. And so they'll make a demand for a settlement that's, <clears throat> you know, a, a, a lot of money to you and me, but compared to how much it would cost the potential defendant to actually defend the claim is, is minuscule. You know, typically in the, like, the low six-figure range for, for a license. Um, those types of plaintiffs, the, the challenge is to find leverage against them, right? To find a way 
to uh, to to make their claim uh, to make them to make them have something to lose in the game as well, and that can come in a, a few different forms. Um, we've had success, you know, looking at kind of the legal technicalities of the way they brought the claim, and then uh, you know leveraging those. Another uh, ch another opportunity that you have is if you are aware of prior art that invalidates the claims of a patent, you can go to the to the person who's brought the claims and say, "Hey, we're aware of this prior art. You can give us a license for nothing, or we can." Make, we can broadcast this prior art to the world, right? Because they don't want that prior art to come out. So there, there are some kind of pain points for those types of plaintiffs, and, and the key is to try to find those pain points and to push on them and, and to use those to, to get an outcome where you're not writing a bunch of checks, um, but at the same time, you don't have to deal with them anymore. Yeah, of course, it's very important to do that this uh, early stage of the AR field, so we're not uh, s allowing these, these folks to squelch the development of, of this technology. Um, but let's talk about happier, happier applications of this uh, of technology and, and this um, uh, these legal rights as well. So let's say we're, we're we've we've secured a patent and we we want to make money off this patent. Um, and specifically, uh, licensing is one way to do that. If you're not uh, e either practicing the patent yourself and doing the um, the application directly, you have customers that are. Um, taking advantage of it. So, so Matt, what are your, what are your thoughts on, on the best way to capitalize on patent protection once you've secured it? Uh, well, we're still going through that process <laughs> right now. Uh, it's not easy as a startup. Um, yeah, I think one misconception, you know, outside of a few bad apples, uh, you know, there's legitimate enforcement of patent rights, and I think that there's a misconception that patents block innovation, and really it's patents block replication, and that's what you're getting protection for, people taking your ideas and, and replicating them. So it's a challenge as a startup because there's a lot, of, uh, a lot of barriers to really go after people that are infringing your technology, and uh, it's not easy as a startup to go that route. You have to either find a contingency-based attorney to enforce your rights. You can go the licensing route, but unless there is you know, if there's a bite behind the bark, you know, nobody's going to license. It's just, it, it's just not mm -hmm. a feasible manner. You can be the nice guy, but people ty typically won't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If, if, I could, if I could jump in really quickly, I, this kind of speaks to one of the reasons I find being a patent attorney very rewarding, and Brett probably has a similar experience. You know, a lot of times you go to an attorney, you, you're going to an attorney to help you comply with something, you're going to an attorney to help you uh, avoid an issue with another party. Being a patent attorney is interesting because what we do is create assets for companies. Uh, from, this, from the moment that a, that, a, that a company files a patent application, that, that application is worth, you know, on the order, it, around an order of magnitude more to that company than they spent in legal fees to file it, even while it's still an application. Um, so uh, patents and patent applications are valuable to a company. One of the ways they're valuable is through the offensive use, which is what Matt and Brian are talking about, where you, you know, you find licensees, you um, monetize in that way but it's also it's an asset that can be monetized through a sale it's a it's an asset that uh, if there's an acquisition can add to a purchase price um, and then there's also kind of the passive value of patents which is the defensive aspect of patents you know one of the things Matt and I actually were talking about earlier is that you know AR although the technology is emerging the idea of AR has been around for a long time it's something that's captured people's imaginations for a long time and because of that it's actually a fairly crowded patent space. Um, you know, people can file for applications before they have something that's go-to-market ready, right? It's just kind of a prototype that kind of works is enough. Even just an idea of how you're going to make the thing work is enough to, to file a patent application. And so what we find is that the AR space actually is, is fairly crowded when it comes to kind of the fundamental uh, crux of AR. But <clears throat> despite, that, despite that crowdedness, if you're able to carve out a niche, you know, you can unlock uh, some of this value for your company, and the defensive value being that there are these portfolios that exist. There are big companies in AR that have large portfolios. If you if you own patents, one of the, one of the first things that that there is, let's say uh, that you have a small company, a large company that holds a patent portfolio that wants to enforce it against you because you're starting to steal some of their market. The first thing their their attorney is going to say to them. Well, does the small company have any patents they can enforce against you, right? Because now it's not just them coming and suing you for patent infringement. Now there's a counterclaim that they're going to have to deal with of infringement on their own system. And if you're a smaller company and they're a larger company, the damages are probably going to be in your favor, right? Because they have more revenue, so there's going to be more damages. There's going to be more of a royalty. 
So the, the value of patents is not just this offensive value, but it's this defensive value of being able to go out and compete with confidence in a marketplace against larger players, knowing they're not going to bring a patent infringement claim against you to squelch your progress because you can bring a claim back against them. So that, that's another aspect of the value of patents that's oft, often overlooked. Yeah, Ben, Brett mentioned uh, in the introduction of his talk the difference between the right to exclude someone or prevent someone from, from doing something, which is directly what a patent provides, and the uh, freedom to operate or the freedom to practice the invention. Tell us a little bit about the distinction between the two. That, that's, that's, a, that's an analysis that actually gets uh, missed a lot of times is that people will <clears throat> they'll equate uh, patentability with freedom to operate. And whether or not you infringe someone, someone else's patent rights or whether what you've got can be patented are actually two very different legal analyses. When it comes to, be, to acquiring a patent, the requirements for patentability are, um, as Brett spoke to a little bit, first that it's the kind of thing that can be patented. It's, it's patentable subject matter. This is the kind of thing that can be patented. The second requirement is that your invention is new and non-obvious. So if someone else has disclosed it before, or if in light of what other people have disclosed, your invention would be obvious, you're not entitled to a patent. Now, on the, f on the converse side, when it comes to the rights other people hold, other people may hold patents that have, maybe they haven't gone as far as you, but still will preclude you from practicing your invention. The, the, one of the classic uh, examples is a bicycle versus a bicycle with training wheels. So if I, if I have watched my children crash on their bicycles over and over again, and I think, wow, it'd be great if we put two wheels on the side, right, and taught them to ride a bicycle that way. I patent a bicycle with training wheels. That's patentable because no one has done that before. However, there may be somebody else who holds a patent on a bicycle. That means they can exclude me from making, using, or selling a bicycle, whether or not it has training wheels. Um, Another way to kind of describe it is that when it comes to infringement of other people's rights, if you look at a patent and, and the, the part that stakes out what someone is entitled to exclude other people from doing is called the claims, and it appears at the back of the patent. It's the numbered sentences that appear at the back of the patent. And you look at those like a recipe. So if a claim says that an invention has elements A, B, and C, the way that you infringe is by having A, B, and C. You can't say I don't infringe because I also include D. The only way to say you don't infringe is by saying, I don't have C, right? I use D instead, or I don't, I don't use anything for that element. That's how you avoid infringement of a patent. So it is, it's a little bit nuanced, but they're very different analyses when it comes to, is what I have, what I, is what I have done new and non-obvious, and then do I infringe other people's rights? It's an important distinction to understand, because just because we get a patent doesn't mean that we can just go out and start doing everything we want with it. Uh, although, as, as Ben uh, and, and Brett have described, it's in a, becomes an important asset. Now, Matt, you, you made the decision uh, at an early point that this was an asset worth obtaining to you. And that alone sets you apart from a lot of the startups, not just in this space, but in the tech world in general, who they look at, they look at the patent process solely as, as an expense. Like, uh, they look at their finances, they say, I barely have enough money to keep the doors open, much less pay a lawyer. Uh, why was it important enough for you to go get that asset? Uh, well, we, we felt that this was going to be an area, you know, we believed in what we were doing with virtual dressing rooms and the platform, and we knew that this was going to expand beyond just uh, initially using a marker to 2D to 3D to video conferencing and so on. So we had a very long-term vision for it, and we felt it was important enough to do that. When you talk to a lot of uh, venture capitalists or other startups, there, there's kind of a... It, it, there's a back and forth conversation. Do you focus on building market share? Or do you focus, you know, revenue, initial revenue that you don't have a lot of on obtaining IP? And uh, you know, for technology fields, I think it's very critical that you obtain the IP. You, know, you obtain IP because, you know, one of the things we're seeing is we're seeing these larger, larger tech giants now moving into the space that we init initially developed. And you know, going back to what was discussed earlier. If you don't have those IP rights, there, there's no way you can compete as a startup with a, a tech giant that has a you know, billion dollar marketing revenue and can easily gain market share in that space. With IP, that's your only defense against that. Okay. And Matt, we've got a few minutes left, and in that time, I want to ask you a question about a phrase that you shared with me in getting ready for this panel, and that's um, business development in disguise. Tell me what, that, what you mean by that and, and how patent rights relate to that. Yeah, um, I, you know, what I was discussing with Brian is that, you know, over the last four years, we've had some larger tech companies do the, hey, we want to talk to you about projects or we want to talk to you about your technology. They, you know, you sign the NDA, they have these conversations with you, usually, you know, can go from anywhere from two months to four months. Then all of a sudden, you don't hear back for about four months to six months, and then all of a sudden, you see a replication of your technology in market, and it's 
it's one of those things that's gotten increasingly frustrating as a startup because you're just you, you just start feeling like what can I do to protect myself? It's it's the most frustrating thing I think we've ever dealt with as a company. Mm -hmm. Now you shared with me an example of of how you, how others have stopped that or at least vindicated themselves when that happened. Oh yeah, their uh, first round capital invested in a company uh, called Tech Forward. This is this is about a year or two ago, but six months ago, uh, what had happened is Tech Forward was uh, working with Best Buy and trying to implement their loyalty program. They had a, a proprietary loyalty program. Uh, and Best Buy was reviewing it. They had signed agreements. But be before Best Buy would commit to an agreement, they had actually uh, asked to see all the technical details of uh, Tech Forward's loyalty program. So they did that, and then all of a sudden, Best Buy went silent, got back to Tech Forward a few weeks later, and said, you know, we're not going to use you. We're going to develop our own loyalty program. Turns out they had replicated all the technical details Tech Forward had, and then uh, uh, Tech Forward actually had to sue Best Buy, and they won a $27 million judgment against Best Buy. So I thought in the first round, one of the, you, VCs usually don't fund lawsuits, but first round felt so strongly that Best Buy had pretty much uh, done wrong that they helped fund that, and you know the startup got vindicated with that award. Okay. Now, obviously, it's it's a rare example that that someone takes that litigation all the way forward. It's a good yeah. good thing that that precedent was set. But do you, do you have any thoughts on how how you go about protecting yourself from th something like this? The still in progress. I, I would <laughs> say. <laughs> Okay, okay, I want to make sure we have enough time left for questions at the end, so I'm going to pivot now uh, and, and head over to our, our final presenter, who's uh, Nicola Liberati. Nicola has traveled all the way from the University of Pisa in Italy to speak to us today, so I want to make sure that we give him his uh, full opportunity to share his thoughts with us. He is a, uh, a, a PhD student in philosophy at the University of Pisa, and he's, he ha spoke at ISMAR last year in Atlanta, if any of you caught his presentation there. Um, so he's, he's done a lot of thinking about how, uh, from a phenomenological point of view, we perceive uh, items in augmented space and, and how they affect uh, us from an ethical point of view. So we, we want to make sure to include his perspective to, to cover the full range of this panel, which is both from law and from ethics. So now we we've, we, we've under, understand the, the legal process. We've used that legal process to obtain our products. We're out in society using them. Now, what, what are the consequences for not just the rules of law, but the rules of ethics and, and how we are... Um, how we're implicating those and ourselves and our experience through utilizing these products. You may have heard uh, Brian Mullins in his uh, portion of the speech yesterday about the future of AR. He, he led off by, by asking the question, is a, what, what's more important or what's more real, the idea of a table or a physical table or the augmented representation of a table? And his conclusion was, uh, to, to him, they're all, they're all equivalent. They're all the same. Well, uh, Nicola has done a lot of thinking about how we perceive things. He might, he might tell us that uh, he agrees. He might tell, we'll put a little bit more nuance on that question. So it's, uh, as soon as the uh, technology is up and running, uh, he'll get a chance to share those. Um, while, while we're working on that, <laughs> let's, uh, we'll, we'll bookmark that and ask a legal question. Yes, sir. Um, quick get affected by first to file. So if I would have been using this technology, but I didn't file a patent, and then somebody else files a patent, what happens? So that's one of the caveats with the trade secret. Can you guys hear me OK? Um, I'm not sure about oh, the technical um, That's right. Um, so one of the caveats with the trade secret is that when you hold it in secrecy, and you could potentially hold it in secrecy forever, whereas a patent is only good for 20 years. Um, really find it. But if someone else thinks of that idea and decides to get patent protection for it, they can then preclude you from ever doing it again, even though you thought of it earlier, even though you're holding it in secrecy. But especially now with first to file, since you never made it public, you never let it into the public domain. So if someone thinks of it... Um, even if you've been selling your product? Well, if you're selling it, and so if, you, if, if this has to do with the product, you're selling your, your product, then it's in the public domain. No, but the design, this how it was implemented. So, so how you created the product, the process about how you created the product, um, and, 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 and by virtue of selling the product, it was impossible to determine how it was made. 
then, then yes, if someone else decided to patent that process, the, pa the patent process is a quid pro quo program, the, meaning that you have to give something to get something. And you have to give full disclosure. Your patent application has to be enabling, written with an adequate description that allows certain, allows a person of ordinary skill in the art to make and use the invention so that when your patent expires, it goes in the public domain and the public can then make and use your invention. If you decide to forego that program, that, that process, and, and try to hold it as a trade secret, the penalty is that if someone else thinks of it independently and files on it, they can then stop you from doing it. Okay. Let's uh, put in another bookmark in that legal conversation and uh, segue back to Nicole. Hi. Hello, everyone. How are you? Very good. Fun. <laughs> thank you very much for being here. And thank you, Brian, for your presentation. Well, I will talk about AI glasses in the proximate future, when, at least in theory, this technology will be spread at any level in our culture and it will be used as a common device by almost everyone. The aim of my presentation is to study the modification yielded by air glasses, and I will, st um, I will structure my work in two main parts. The first one will be related on how the perceptual object is constituted by its hidden aspect, because we will see how technologies modify these particular parts of the object. And here, I will analyze the concept of, Hus uh, of horizon in Husserl phenomenology in order to classify the different types of hidden, horizon, uh, hidden aspects. Sorry. The second part will be focused on uh, how glasses modify our perception. And here, I will analyze the case of classical optical glasses and two different case, uh, cases of uh, air glasses. So, Husserl phenomenology suggests us that for the constitution of the perceived object are not important its manifest aspects only, but even the hidden ones. For example, I do not see this part of the pulpit, but uh, it plays an active role in the constitution of the object pulpit in front of me. And these hidden faces can be classified in um, three main categories, inner horizon, outer horizon, and world horizon. The inner horizon is related to the fact that the object shows different faces according to the spatial position of the subject. For example, we can turn the object in our hand in order to see what is on its back, or that is more important for our analysis, we can get closer to it in order to perceive more details of this object. Secondly, we have the outer horizon. While the inner horizon is related to what is in the object, even if it's not perceived by the subject, the outer horizon concerns what lies outside the object in its background. For example, while I'm focusing my attention on this pulpit, the background constitute it as a pulpit in a conference room that is quite different, for example, from a pulpit in a church. The third one is the world horizon that is related to the world experience of the subject and of the community where he lives in. We have expectation and anticipations of possible perception of an object because we are related to other experiences of it. For example, no child deliberately touch, oh sorry, <laughs> no child deliberately touch the fire twice be, um, because his experiences, his past experiences, thought it will cause pain. Thus, following this distinction among horizon, we can analyze what the use of glasses modifies, that is, what kind of parts of the object is modified by the use of such technologies. Well, first of all, glasses, are not a new technology at all. Therefore, we can analyze the classical glasses in order to better understand how glasses based on AR works. So, the use of classical glasses, classical optical glasses like this one, helps the subject to perceive more details and the object becomes sharper. That means there is a modification of the inner horizon of the object because to wear glasses is an action comparable to get closer to the object in order to perceive more details of it. And this 
main um, modification entails two consequences. First, um, firstly, the object is reconstituted uh, um, with this new better inner horizon, because now the object has more details. Therefore, an object that is not perceived with such new sharpness is perceived as unfitted and inadequate. The object is seen as blurred, and the subject has to wear glasses in order to appreciate the details. Just um, having another example to make this um, re reconstitution of the object uh, clearer, I think, um, think about telescope. Through the telescope, you manage to perceive the mountains of the moon. So when you look at it with uh, your naked eye, you, uh, you perceive the moon as an object that has more details than the ones you can actually perceive with your natural body. Because the moon is reconstituted following the new inner horizon provided by the technology. S second point, even the subject is reconstituted following this new inner horizon. Because a subject who cannot perceive such boosted sharpness is considered unfitted as well. For example, he's considered myopic by the society where he lives in. So, the use of a technology is a knock-on effect on the constitution of object and subject. And there is a modification of their normality. And this is the main point I'm going to use with uh, AI glasses. So, now we can analyze, um, analyze AI glasses following this re main result, but first of all, I would like to identify two different kinds of uh, AI glasses. The first one is an AI glasses that uh, provide information about the perceived object, such as the case of a text related to the external object. And I think this is uh, the case of uh, some glasses we have seen in, in the expo. The second one is a kind of air glasses that can create an augmented object intertwined with the real environment. An object among common, not digital objects. And uh, I still see, uh, so some of these prototypes yesterday in, in the expo uh, following this direction, especially the ones that allow you to touch the object and to have some interaction with it. Actually, I do not know when these AI glasses will be available for everyone, but if we have to consider the proximate future where AI glasses are used by everyone, we can hypothesize even this uh, kind of uh, glasses as a device that is uh, mm, well developed and uh, used by everyone. But what does the first kind of AI glasses yield? In this case, we have the modification of the outer horizon because we have information displayed around the object. That, in, that means that we have information in the background of the perceptual object. As in the previous case, where the inner horizon was modified, we have a knock-on effect at the level of the constitution of the object and subject. Firstly, the object is reconstituted because through technology, is get, it, it gets uh, a new background. So an object that does not have this new outer horizon will be considered inadequate as the blur object with classical glasses. Secondly, we have a reconstitution of the subject as well, because a subject who cannot um, perceive this new outer horizon will be considered inadequate, because the subject cannot perceive the object in its informational background that now um, has become a part, an integrant part of the object. So, as you can see, it's not a question of the quantity of information the subject can get or a question of which information should be given to him. For example, the classical problem concerning privacy. What is at stake here is the modification of the normality of the subject because it's modified the way the subject perceives the background of the object in general. With the second kind of AR glasses, the one created uh, augmented objects intertwined with the real world, such as the case uh, of uh, these triceratops in the living room, we do not have the modification of any horizon 
because the object is created entirely by the technology and it does not exist before. Therefore, any kind of knock-on effects on the constitution of the object is excluded. However, we have the modification of the world where the subject lives in because digital augmented objects are added to it. Moreover, we still have a knock-on effect in the subject constitution. While with, the class while with classical glasses, the subject is inadequate or inadequate according to his capacity of perceiving the details perceivable through lenses, and with the first kind of uh, air glasses, the subject is adequate or inadequate according to his capacity to perceive the information provided by the air glasses. Now, with this kind of glasses, the subject is adequate or inadequate according to his capacity to have any perception of the augmented object. So, due to, the, uh, to this kind of technology, the world um, of this proximate future that is the classical our world of common object plus the augmented objects become reachable um, through technology only. Therefore, inadequate subjects who do not use air glasses simply do not live in the same world of others. They live in a poor world um, because they simply cannot perceive entire parts of this world. In conclusion, we have seen how the usage of a technologies modifies the subject, and in particular, with the first kind of air glasses, a normal subject is a subject that can perceive uh, a new background of the object provided by the technology. And with the second type of air glasses, a normal subject is a subject who can perceive the new augmented parts of the world. So, as you can see, the main point for ethics at least I suppose so, is that we should not focus our attention only on what we can do with such technology, but even on what we become by using it. Thank you. A lot of deep questions being raised by this conference. We, um, thank you, Nicola. We have uh, a few minutes, I think we have 10 minutes left in our time altogether um, for the panel before we break for lunch. Uh, we have more questions. Um, Yes, sir. Um, I, I feel like am I on my turn to call the industry the problem? Uh, you're, you're, you're good. We've got technical support on the way, but we can hear you. Okay, so uh, I feel like we've gotten kind of one side of a, of a story. I mean, we've got two patent attorneys and a CEO of a company who has patent protection. Is it possible that you guys could like flip over and play your alter egos and tell us why patenting is stifling innovation? Uh, well, we've heard from Ben and Matt why, uh, why, why we don't think that it is. But Matt, I think you have, you have a response? Yeah, I, I mean, I can give perspective. Before, we re, uh, you know, before 2009, we weren't in the AR software industry. We were an marketing, interactive marketing agency from 2001 to 2008. We had never thought about patents. We had gone, you know, we had done other things. And there, there was a specific example I can use where... Um, we, as an agency, were told by a client to recreate something that was on the web, and we did. The client then got a notice that they were being, you know, you are, uh, I don't know if it was a copyright or uh, I believe it was a copyright claim. And then the client came down on us, and we're like, you told us to do this. So uh, on the flip side of that, I, you know, we've been on both sides of it. We, we didn't know what patent protection was at the time when we were an agency and so on. As we've kind of gotten into this space, you know, we're still on both sides of it. We see what some, you know, we see what patent uh, trolls are doing in the space and so on. So we're concerned about that. There's, like I said, there's legitimate uses for patent enforcement, and there's some bad apples that are going out there. So I think there's a genuine uh, concern about how, as an industry, can we potentially stop that or do something to alleviate that concern. But on the other hand, as we're a startup that's looking at all these other larger tech companies going in the space. We have to sit there about what's, how do we survive when this is happening because not only are they taking market share away from us, they're taking press away from us. They're taking all these separate things away from us where you, know, you feel slighted uh, from that perspective. So I don't, I don't know if I can fully give you the other half of it, but you know, we've been on both sides of the table. Well, let me clarify my question that um, it, it, the example being if, you know, it's a lot easier to think of something than it is to do something. And you can bring smart people together who can 
think out a lot of patents and say, oh, okay, eyes in the back of the head, let's patent the whole thing. Uh, let's, you know, it's a lot easier to think of those things and patent them than it is to actually do them sure. and invest in them and make them happen. Well, and again, then it says. That's not necessarily true because to patent it, you, that your idea, when you disclose it in a patent, has to be disclosed in a way that an ordinary person, a person of ordinary skill can make and use the invention. It means it has to be enabled. So you should be able to make that invention if it's, if it's, if it's a valid patent. Um, I don't think patents stop innovation. I think it drives innovation because if someone says you can't do something because I thought of this first, well, then you're going to think of a different way to do it or a better way to do it. I get clients that come to me all the time and say, there's this patent here. We want, we want to do this. How do we get around this patent? We help them think of ways to do something that they can do that doesn't fall within the scope of that patent. The, like Ben mentioned, the back part of the, the, the last section of a patent is the claims. The claims set out the meets and bounds of your intellectual property. And there's a whole lot of uh, law that sets out how those claims are read and construed and, 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 and how that, that scope is determined. But in the end, it's, you can draw a circle around it, metaphorically, and you should be able to find something outside that circle to do. And yeah, if you have all these people in, in the room who can think of all these ideas, mm -hmm. they should be able to think of one more. <laughs> uh, we want to make time for at least one more question, sir. Yeah, this uh, question actually probably most closely relates to Nicola's presentation. In a previous forum, uh, they talked about architecture, uh, overlaying AR on architecture, and there's actually some cases already where people who own properties feel a right to that virtual space. Uh, my question is, should we as a community try to proactively or offensively lobby for legislation to kind of preemptive that? you know, preemptive strike to, you know, open open that virtual space up. Because to me, that's it seems ludicrous that somebody, you know, feels the right to a virtual space in a program that you've written. So the, the question is, does, should that virtual space belong to everyone? Right. Should it be in the commons, I guess? Yeah. Well, I suppose so. But uh, what is more important for me uh, is uh, to create one virtual space that is uh, intertwined with uh, the reality. So, for example, I don't know, to create uh, a monument uh, just in the middle of a square that can be viewed by everyone. So, not multiple uh, virtual spaces, but just one that is uh, completely intertwined with the real world. That is, I suppose, the scope of uh, augmented reality, or at least one of the scopes. Yeah. So it speaks to the, the, the concept of creating a digital commons in the first place. Uh, that's good. Um, in, sir, yes, here. Recently, I think it was the the administration was just talking about some executive actions to deal with patent trolls, mm -hmm. and it was the, the idea that uh, if they lost, uh, that they would have to pay the fees of the people filing the suit, uh, as opposed to um, uh, before. I mean, you could have a big company make the uh, entrepreneur go broke trying to defend the patents, and they were that was turning us on the head. That just recently. Came out. I don't know if it's if it's uh, just in its early stages or not. But any of you have comments on that? Because that could certainly change things. I would think. Well, I think the, the specific remedy that you're describing of, of loser pays. That's uh, the object of the Shield Act, which is is being discussed. Uh, the president just did just come out yesterday with some executive orders, uh, including some direction on on how to interpret software patents. Ben, I see you're uh, you, you've got something to say about this. Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> but uh, either Ben, Brett, thoughts about the, not only the executive order being uh, taken by, by the president, but also the, the various pieces of legislation that are being uh, debated about. How effective do you think that's going to be in, in, in preventing this troll activity? Well, again, I think I th sometimes I think patent trolls get a bad rap. That's just my personal opinion. But I mean, just, they're, just they're a patent holder. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they're a patent holder. Why should a patent troll be treated any different than any other patent holder? Each patent holder should be able to equally enforce their rights, whether they're a practicing entity or a non-practicing entity. They have an intellectual property right. It's, a, it's an asset, and they should be able to, to uh, generate revenue off that asset if they decide to do so. They spent money obtaining it, so they should be able to to generate revenue off of it if that was their goal in obtaining it. Now, a lot of people don't like patent trolls because they say they're not practicing what they're doing. They're just simply going after other companies to generate revenue. But again, those other companies could think of a better way of doing it or think of a different way of doing it. Um, and that's what drives technology. That's what makes people think of the next great thing. Another big thing is that, well, a patent is good for 20 years. Well, only if you pay the maintenance fees. A 
lot of patents go expired after the four-year mark. You get that first four years after, you, know, you pay your issuance fee and you got those first four years and then you got to pay a maintenance fee. It, it's only worthwhile to pay that maintenance fee if you're making money off of that patent, either by commercializing a product or some other way. Otherwise, why are you going to pay that maintenance fee? And then again at the eighth year and again at the twelfth year, and those fees go up with the, with the public policy of putting this out into the public domain if it's not generating revenue for you. So. We learned that from Harry Potter, right? Trolls are people too. Just, just really quickly, I, when it comes to the fee shifting or the loser pays uh, uh, approach, I actually think it's an interesting approach to the problem. I mean, one of the one of the big issues, as I said, pinning people as trolls is, is a very broad brush, right? There are people who are essentially, there are companies that are essentially shaking down other companies for, for what amounts to not very much money. And, if, and those would probably go away if the loser pays. Um, what it would do in the end, though, likely, is just make, money for insurance companies because legitimate defendants or legitimate plaintiffs to get contingency representation would have to find uh, an insurance policy, someone that would insure their claim so that if they lost would pay the other side's attorney's fees and that insurance company would then take a cut of any winning. So it would be like a contingency insurance claim for the, for, for, the loser, for the loser's fees. So I mean really what you're doing is adding another layer of market oversight to those claims, right? And probably um, putting money into the pockets of, of some uh, entrepreneurial insurance businesses. Okay, I think we're, uh, do we have time for one more? Can, okay. can somebody speak a little bit to the subjectivity of obvious use and sort of how that's defended? Uh, do you, are you referring to whether something's, uh, whether an invention's obvious or not? I mean, so there, as with most things in the law, obvious doesn't mean obvious, right? Obvious is a, is a buzzword that we use for <laughs> Uh, the legal standard by which it's determined whether it would have been obvious to create something at the time an application was filed. Um, there are Supreme Court cases on it that talk about, you know, what, 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 whether something is obvious or not. The, the most famous one is uh, Graham versus John Deere. And it says that you look at the, the skill of an ordinary person in the art, you look at the scope of the prior art, and you look at the differences between the invention and the prior art, and you, and you kind of holistically decide is this something that just would have been obvious? You know, given what is there, would it have been obvious? Now, the most recent case law says that you're entitled to a patent and something is not obvious when there's kind of a, an unexpected result or, or some kind of synergistic action in the combination of, of two pre-existing uh, ideas or concepts. Um, and then there are a lot of kind of secondary indicia around that. But that's, that's kind of the guideline by which the, the, the determination should be made, right? Is this kind of holistic approach, when I put these things together, do they just act as they did before, or is this something that is interesting, right? It, there's, a, there's an unexpected result from it. Yeah, I think that's gonna need to be the last word. Um, again, you can find out more, Bill, from, uh, Ben, from the um, Pillsbury firm, pillsbury.com, and down the booth downstairs, zugara.com is, uh, is, is Matt's company. Uh, Nicola is here from the University of Pisa. Make sure to talk to him if you have questions about his perspective. Uh, Brett and I from the Honigman firm, honigman.com, and again, my blog at augmentedlegality.com. Enjoy your lunch, and thank you to the panel.